closing. Hounslow Heath on the outskirts of London, and there's nothing on this sad stretch of wasteland to suggest that this was not only the site for Britain's first international airport, but arguably where the whole thing began. In our first two programmes, we looked at air travel as it is today, and took note of some of the questions that are being asked on its 60th birthday. Well, now we're going back to where it all started. 60 years ago, I imagine the only question anyone was asking is, will I get there or will the infernal machine fall out of the sky? Most people then were sensibly still travelling by train or by boat on horses or on donkeys. And yet, on the 25th of August, 60 years ago, the first international daily scheduled air service started here on Hounslow Heath, where the highwayman Dick Turpin used to ride. <laughs> The First World War had just ended, and a newly formed airline, Aircraft Transport and Travel, had come into being. On that first scheduled flight across the English Channel to Paris, the plane carried four passengers, a bundle of newspapers, some jars of Devonshire cream, and several brace of grouse. The trip took two hours and 25 minutes. The age of fair... From 1936, they were flying from here in Southampton docks to points all over the empire. These are the stairs where the flying boat passengers embarked and disembarked. And that's the old terminal, which is still called Imperial House. I wonder if any of the captains of the great ocean-going liners that were docking here in the 1930s ever imagined how quickly they would be commercially wiped out by those toy-like objects that were taking off and landing around them. A glance at the Southampton Dock Shipping Guide for 1937 is extremely revealing. First of all, it shows that uh, more than half a million passengers embarked and disembarked here from ships. It shows that there were 40 sailings to New York alone, 40 sailings a month. Today, there isn't one that operates all the year round. It wasn't just that the aeroplane could carry passengers so much more quickly, but with the coming of the flying boat, it could now carry them in considerable comfort. For those going home on leave from the outposts of empire, the flying boats offered a speedy alternative to the long sea voyage, plus some of its familiar aspects, including the nautical jargon. Up forward, there was a smoking cabin for seven passengers. Up aloft, in his own little office, a ship's purser ironed out any passenger difficulties. Below him, the galley and ladies' and gentlemen's lavatories. Amidships, a cabin for three passengers by day and four at night. The main cabin had a promenade deck from which to look out at the sights below. The specially designed reclining seats had hot and cold air vents and a bell push for the steward. It was a kind of club, but however much service was appreciated, there was no tipping, one of the big differences then and now between travel by air and by boat or rail. Until as recently as the 1950s, air travel was still one class in effect, 